Hi, my name is Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to The Engineering Room, a series of conversations with influential people from our industry. This episode's a little different to the usual content on the Continuous Delivery channel. This is in, in addition to our usual weekly output and is meant in part as a small Christmas present to our viewers and subscribers to thank you for your support over the past year. Uh, if you'd like to see more content like this, please do subscribe if you're not already and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Today I'm talking with another old friend of mine. Today I'm talking to Goiko Adzik. I first met Goiko at a meetup in London, which he was organising. He impressed me at the time of some kind of force of nature. If you've ever been in Goiko's company, seen him talk at a conference or even watched a video of him presenting, you'll know exactly what I mean. Goiko is smart, incisive, witty, a lot of fun to spend time with. He's also a pro prolific serial author, having written many excellent books, several of which I carry around on my iPad to remind me of ideas when I'm doing work. Um, he's done that both alone and often in collaboration with his friend David Evans. Goiko is a sought after conference speaker, always entertaining and thought, thought provoking. He's also one of the people that really does things, not just talks about it. He's an expert on building complex systems, domain driven design and cloud based systems. Goiko was an early adopter of serverless systems has inevitably written great books on the topic. Uh, he also runs a successful online cloud-based software as a service system for mind mapping called MindMap, which costs him pennies to run and is used by millions of people. Most of all, though, Goiko is a practical, effective problem solver. Goiko is the person who comes up with an idea where you think, oh, of course, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Goiko nearly always has a provocative, interesting angle on things. So let me introduce you to my friend, Goiko. Goiko Adzik, welcome to and thanks for agreeing to chat with me here today. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. So, uh, so I, I, when I think of you, I, I, I always struggle to kind of tie you down and explain you to people. Um, uh, and my long rambling introduction is probably testament to that. So you're an expert on BDD, having written the specification by example book which certainly enhanced my thinking on that topic. Oh, thank you um, very much. DDD as well. You, for a long time, you used to run DDD training in Europe, franchise from, from, from Eric Evans. Um, and, and also I think of you as a kind of deep thinker on cloud-based systems, not just the, the easy stuff of the syntax, but the important parts about the architecture of big distributed systems on, you know, on, on cloud platforms and so on. Um, but you're also deeply focused on the value that your work brings to customers uh, and, and the systems that we build for them. Um, on your website, if I can quote you back to yourself, it says, Goiko specializes in agile and lean quality improvement, in particular, impact mapping, agile testing, specification by example, and behavior-driven development. So can you explain how and where you start, where you begin on something new? Oh. Um... So uh, for kind of building my own products, usually I start by scratching my own itch. That's kind of, I think, uh, always a good thing to know that th there is a problem that uh, somebody needs to have solved. And um, last two things big that I built, this mind mapping tool you've mentioned, and um, I'm currently working on a um, video, video building platform for developers where you can just kind of, punch in a bit of markdown and keep it in version control and it keeps building videos for you continuously. So um, things like that usually kind of, you know, scratching my own itch, but um, the next step after that, once uh, shell scripts are no longer useful and I want to expose it to somebody, then trying to figure out what is the right uh, change in, in somebody's behavior that this product will support. I think that was one of the, most profound lessons I've learned that's not really technical in, in my career is that uh, behavior changes are, are really, 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 really good ways of measuring and, and designing value uh, in kind of IT systems in general. And um, lots of people talk about outcomes and, and uh goals and lots of different types of goals and things like that. But everybody wants to have 
uh, double the profit, triple the market share, and, and things like that. And these things are wonderful as something that we can aim towards for a longer period of time, but they're rubbish as something that we can use to say, am I going in the right direction? Yeah. Am I, is, is this feature that I've built this week and, and deployed to production today, is that useful or not useful? Is that any good? And um, that's where these kind of behavior changes come in as, as something that um, both can help us figure out where is the value of stuff in, in intermediate value, not double the profit, triple the market share, but something that's kind of in the middle of that and deliverables and something that we can track for next week, for you know, ne next month, am I actually delivering stuff that matters? I mean, there was a wonderful, I, a case study, uh, how to do this wrong. Of course, you know, case studies, how to do stuff wrong, going to the news uh, with uh, the uh, BBC, my, my BBC uh, kind of uh, uh, iPlayer adjustment where they were doing personalization uh, for the iPlayer. And I think they've spent something like 75 million quid before uh, dropping the whole thing because... Um, it delivered no value. And then the, the, <laughs> the, the National Audit Office got involved to figure out how can you possibly spend 75 million pounds on, on, on software that delivers no value and not learn that before. And um, <laughs> the, um, I'm, I'm going to send you the link to the uh, results of, of the review so you can publish it for, for your viewers. It's a really fun read. It concludes that they could spend so much money because the project was agile. <laughs> and what that meant was that kind of every month, the, 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 the people who provided requirements could make up the benefits as they went along. Yeah. And, you know, then there's always, always something good that we delivered. But um, um, I think if you're the BBC and you're funded by public subscription, you can waste as much money as you want. And if you're a large organization, kind of it's, it's very uh, rare that people kind of try to figure out, are we, are we actually delivering value with this? Um, but I was um, a CTO of a very small company some, what, 14 years ago now, something like that, where uh, we got that completely wrong. We were, we were technically, the, the team I worked with then was still to this day, the best technical team I've ever worked with. No, no, no contest at all. I mean, we, we had, um, stuff that you know ended up being called continuous delivery when you publish the book but before the book came out we we had <laughs> um lots of really interesting stuff technically we were very very early adopters of uh, aws we were deployed on on ec2 in 2008 um and and stuff like that and and um we delivered absolutely zero value. I'm ashamed to say this. <laughs> um, and the co company ran out of money as a result. And I was very, very embarrassed as, as um, uh, having this massively um, inflated ego and uh, you know thinking that we're doing something that's amazing, being a, a CTO of a company that ran out of money. And... Um, I, it was a big wake-up call for me, and I, I, I had to admit that you know that there's there's a ton of stuff we didn't do right, but I didn't even know what we did wrong. I, I it was I just saw the results, I didn't see the cause, so I ended up um, kind of researching how other people solve this problem, and 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 you know whether I, I couldn't believe that this was solely our problem. Some other people must have had this problem, and. Um, yeah, that, that led me to this um, kind of body of, of research and, and materials about behavior changes as value. And I think that's, for me, the starting point is really to try to understand what, what are the behavior changes we're trying to kind of push through here. So, for example, with mind map, we started with the idea to help people create very simple mind maps and share them faster than before. And yeah. that's what we measured. That's what we looked at. That's what we measured. And, you know, that helped us define the product with NeraKit. Um, kind of when it emerged from shell scripts, it came out as an idea to help people really build videos more consistently and faster than before, not having to re-record and re-edit every time and, and, and do these things. 
So kind of s s some idea of, of value as behavior change is incredibly helpful to translate these longer term goals to something that's more actionable and know whether we're actually going the right direction or not. That's, that's one of the key ideas that I took from in your book, Impact Mapping, was I, I really liked, you got, you got the series of questions that you use to help drive the impact mapping pro process. And I really liked the, whose behavior is this going to change? <laughs> and uh, in, I, I've, Impact mapping, <clears throat> yeah, impact mapping is one of these wonderful things that, you know, I've, I've um, kind of stumbled upon do, doing, doing the research I was doing uh, after this company failed and it's, it's a big part of the answer. It's, it's a wonderful way to visualize the big picture and, and have this kind of structure to, to and it's, it's, it's amazingly simple uh, when you look at it and, and, and very, very effective. So um, if, um, yeah, for, for anybody who's kind of struggling with the same issue, check out Impact Mapping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it, a good will, it will save your hair, you, you, you know. It's, We'll we'll put some links to, to to your book your your many books in in, in, the, in the description below. And, and kind of you know impact impact. There's a ton of stuff about impact mapping on impactmapping.org. Um, yeah, people don't have to go and read the book. There's there's like a, a, lots and lots of material about it there. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I mean, you're 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 a, a a prolific publisher of helpful information. I mean, that, uh, thank you. That, no, you 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 certainly are. My, my, my short-term my short memory is horrible, you know, so I, I have to write <laughs> books so to dump, dump my short-term memory uh, on, on, on something that is longer-term-ish. And I, I uh, very kind of, uh, uh, lots of my books are a result of basically uh, trying to make a cloud of, of stuff in my head more consistent. I, I think one. I, I think it's one of the beauties of writing a book is the way that it helps you to organize your own thoughts and and, and crystallize ideas. That's, yeah, the book it's, is it's almost a like a side effect of that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It, it is. I, I I do like that about writing myself. So one one of the other things that I, that I stole from you, and I, I've literally stolen this presentation a few times and and kind of replayed a version. I saw you talking. I can't remember which conference it was at years ago, um, where you were talking about. I, I think it was about it, it was about the ideas of impact mapping, uh, but but the, the, alluding to the thing that you were just describing of trying to find a way of navigating a route towards a solution. And you were making you were you told a funny story about about using you know driving the car with the GPS and your GPS kind of changing the route and all that sort of thing and and pe poking fun at what you know the difference between. The, what we usually call a roadmap in, in in software terms and what a real roadmap is like and how we can use it in different dimensions that idea kind of really resonated with me again in terms of this idea in trying to break problems down into smaller steps having some kind of for what of a better better term sort of a fitness function that determines are you closer or further away from your destination and you can pretty much head off in any random direction as long as you've got that fitness function and you discard the steps that move you further away and keep the steps that move you closer, you'll get there. Yes, yeah, so on the topic of books, you know, it's to, to, to read. And um, the, 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 one of the most interesting books I've read, um, uh, not, not really recently, but it's still, I, I consider it one of the most interesting books is, is Tim Hartford's book, Adapt. Mm -hmm. Hartford is a British economist, and um, it's it's um, strange for people in our industry to you know benefit from reading economic books. <laughs> but um, Adapt is a book uh, that kind of the subtitle, if I remember it correctly, we can find it on Amazon later. Is is why success always starts with failure, and yeah. it's talking about how linear plans generally fail. If if you have a you know a, a, a sequence of steps, you're uh, uh, hoping that everything will work okay. It, it will it will always always fail. And one of the things he does kind of uh, describe very nicely in the book is um, the, these three principles for designing good plans. He calls them Palczynski principles, and and that's a wonderful story on its own. Um, but um, he comes up with three principles for plans that are good when you don't have perfect knowledge and when, when the ground is shifting as you're kind of delivering and things like that. And, and the principles are basically uh, variation, survivability, and selection. It's kind of variation mm -hmm. is 
uh, having, you know, lots of ideas in the plan, not just the minimum of what we're going to do, which is totally opposite of what most people do. We, we, you know, I don't know how many times I've sat in a, in a meeting with must, should, could prioritization, and then yeah. people argue what's a must, what's a should, and 99% and ends as a must. And, and, <laughs> and as opposed to that, you know, have, have more, more stuff in the plan than what we are going to implement, because having more uh, options there makes it easy to replan once you need to replan. Like, like, you know, we, you've mentioned this roadmap presentation, and if you look at the roadmap on uh, any Google Maps, so you know, physical maps, there's there's lots of roads on that map that you are not going to take. But knowing yeah. that these roads are there is helpful in case of trouble because yeah. we know what the options are. Then, kind of the second principle he's talking about is survivability, where if one of these ideas turns out to be wrong um, or problematic or things like that, shouldn't really kill the whole thing. And and yeah. You know, of course, that's kind of, and the third principle is, is the principle of selection. But I, I, again, there's kind of tricky terminology. When people hear selection, they often think prioritization of work up front. What he's yeah. talking about selection is kind of brutal evolutionary selection, killing yeah. off stuff that is not supposed to survive, removing stuff from production that doesn't deserve to be maintained, that doesn't deserve to be tested anymore, that yeah. doesn't deserve to be, you know, effort spending on, on stuff. And I think that's the, that's the one that we're really, really bad at as an industry. Uh, you know, variation, uh, usually people have more ideas than they need. Um, survivability, I think 20 years ago, um, we were, as an industry, relatively bad at doing small stuff. Most people yeah. were thinking about, you know, six months, two year projects. Now, most people I meet kind of do stuff that's doable in weeks or, or even days. Yeah. But we are really, really bad at figuring out this selection criteria. How yeah. do we know what's, you know, out of the stuff we've deployed, what's worth keeping? And, and, how do we even decide on that? Especially, again, that brings us back to this question of measuring some value somehow yes. um, in a way that you can actually say, well, this, you know, what I've done this week actually delivered value or didn't deliver value. And, and not just faking it like the people at the BBC did because it matched some abstract requirements. Yeah. Or, you know, mm. measuring some inter interim step rather than the real value. Matched some person's opinion of, you yeah, know, yeah. Oh, this is nice or blue or, you know. It's one of the, one of the thing one of the ways in which I think uh, I, I talk about the same idea is fr from kind of an engineering point of view is to is to work in in, in in an experimental fashion. And part of what I mean by that there are two key parts one is predict what the outcome is going to be and that tells you what to measure so 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 say you know we're trying to you know increase you know sign ups or registrations or something like that and then that tells you that's what you measure you, you, you you're going to make you're going to measure the outcome of that and that's going to tell you whether that was a good idea yeah, or a bad idea exactly but kind of you know when you look at it so so um, very often what people do in our industry is measure something that's proportional to effort rather than measuring the outcome. Yes. And, and that's not specific to IT. I mean, I, I, again, on the topic yeah. of books, you know, there, there's a, a wonderful book with a clickbait title called How to Measure Anything by Doug Hubbard. Yeah, where yeah. He's talking about business metrics. And, and his conclusion is that in general, you know, people measure what's easy to measure, not what's important. Yeah, yeah. And very often kind of stuff that's proportional to effort is really, really easy to measure. And we end up measuring story points or, you know, function points or some kind of, you know, number of screens or, 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 or stuff like that. And people claim it's value, but it's not. And, and it's, it's horribly yeah. misleading. So you have a new book out on, on uh, kind of engineering practices in software development and feedback is, is like one of the core principles there. But if you look at feedback, yeah. most people in our industry approach feedback from a very naive perspective. Like, oh, you know, we're going to put some dashboards yeah. there and measure some shit and, and then, you yeah. know, numbers are going to go up or down and things like that. But the, the, the whole science of feedback is amazing. I've, I've uh, kind of a couple of years ago really got into reading about the kind of science of feedback. It's, it's a mm. scientific thing that's been explored for probably 150 years or something like that. And really from uh, kind of the second world war onwards and, and kind of the automation that happened as a result of that, 
and feedback, uh, the, the whole idea of measuring feedback and, and control systems and things like that. Um, the, 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 there are books and books and books about that. And one of the key things, uh, you know, there is establishing the right sensors and, and avoiding sensor poisoning and avoiding oscillations that come from delayed feedback and things like that. And, and in a <laughs> trivial, trivial, trivial example, you know, if you have like a, 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 um, a, a thermometer, but the thermometer is outside, it yeah. doesn't even really matter how. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> lots of people are measuring stuff that makes no, there's no relation to what they're doing because it's easy to measure. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's the feed, feedback is absolutely central. I think the, the the value of that to being able to do useful work. I I, I seem to remember that that yeah, so the, the first mechanical device that built feedback into it was in steam engines, and you get those funny little balls on two sticks that with the spring that's on a rotating shaft, and the the centripetal force forces the balls out as they go faster and that kind of you know moves a lever which kind of shuts down the the, the amount of power that's going to the, the steam engine because they blew them they kept blowing up their steam engines before they figured that out and stopped that feedback i mean you know the mechanical uh, system. putting in putting in <laughs> feedback system putting in uh, like uh, uh control systems using feedback is, is amazingly amazingly effective and and yeah. you know it's 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 uh uh but at the same time it's not something that should be approached from a kind of naive perspective because you can, no, no. You can get misled very easily. And, and my, my best guess, I wasn't involved in the BBC project, but my best guess is, you know, they did have feedback if it was agile, whatever that meant. Yeah. But they were probably either measuring the wrong things or they were measuring it too late or... Uh, Story and points whole, and code you know, coverage is my bet. <laughs> <laughs> so you know there, there was there was feedback and the irony is once you have feedback once you have these kind of measurement systems and you're measuring the wrong things it can be horribly horribly misleading you can you can think you're doing well for a long time yeah and and just you know end up faking it until until the the, the kind of penny drops and and somebody has to pay the bill so so so, so what 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 trick do you or, or may, maybe scientific advice that you would give to somebody but but what techniques do you use to try and figure out what those right things are so i think measure? one of the one of the one of the kind of really thought-provoking things and, and this might be totally obvious to other people but i've you know not really uh experienced that before because i um I, I, I didn't study kind of systems thinking. You can study systems mm -hmm. thinking now and things that I, I was self-taught from books is um, kind of in William Detmer's book uh, on, on the logical thinking process, he talks about kind of three types of systems. He talks about systems within your zone of control, mm -hmm. systems within your sphere of influence and systems outside your sphere of influence. And, and so kind of- I, I, I know, Cor I, I know Corey explained that to me recently as the soup exercise in terms of thinking about teams <laughs> the same idea <laughs> and of course you know as a system it, 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 it depends where you are in, in that system you know we, we might be as software people uh stuff that's around software features might be in our zone of control but maybe it's a bit wider maybe you know yeah. stuff that's kind of outside but what, one of the things I've, i'm really really kind of um uh uh, strict on is not measuring the stuff that's in my zone of control because the stuff that's in my zone of control is is you know it, it will work out one way or another if i'm kind of pushing it hard enough it's figuring out stuff that's kind of in the sphere of influence rather than the zone of control so that yeah, you no, just 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 to be clear because um I could misinterpret what you're saying there, and I don't ah. think you're saying it. So, so what when you say you're not measuring it, you're thinking in terms of product direction and that. Yes, yes, value. Thing. Looking at the value. Are in we terms going of value. In direction? So you know, yes. I, I will measure stuff. Yeah, you know, I'm going to measure the quality of the code using tests and things like that. Of course, uh, you know that that is. Thank, but, thank you for reinforcing no, no, the message in my that, YouTube and, channel. And thank you. But <laughs> from from a perspective, are we going the right direction? I think the key question is. You know, are our assumptions playing out to be correct? And, yeah. and that means, is the stuff that's inside a sphere of influence uh, working out as it should or not? 
Mm-hmm. And, and if not, then we need to replan. We need to kind of adjust our work. We need to figure out what we're doing. Yeah. If yes, then we are on the right track. We are going the right direction. Uh, but but um, the, the, um, sometimes people will put stuff that's totally outside of their sphere of influence as, as mm-hmm. things they want to measure. And then, well, you know, yeah. if, it, if it's happening or not happening, it doesn't really depend on you. Um, yeah. Sometimes they will put things that is inside their zone of control. What, one trivial example of that are um, uh, story points. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, we, um, we uh, the, 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 the people that measure progress with how many story points they deliver, they're, they're measuring something that's totally within their zone of control. Yeah. And um, the improvements or, or, or uh, you know, uh, kind of um, failures there are not really telling us that the product is going the right direction or that yep. anything you know useful is happening there they're just telling us that people are coming to work every day or not yep. coming to work or or things like that so um yeah and, and from a process improvement perspective if you look at say you know a consultant who joins the company to to help them do something better faster easier then maybe that's kind of the sphere of influence for that system but n- yeah. n- not, not for a kind of a team building a product. Um, and, and measuring these things ends up again being horribly misleading. There's a wonderful case study of this in, in a paper called Why FBI Cannot Build a Case Management System uh, by Jerome Israel. Uh, it's um, kind of been published a few years ago and it's ma- made its kind of uh, way into lots of popular lean books now. Uh, mm-hmm. I think Mary Poppendick wrote about that in... in uh, uh, her last book and uh, Tom Popenick uh, and, and, and Mary wrote it. Um, I forgot the book name. Um, uh, really embarrassed we'll, now. We'll put it in the description. We'll, we'll put it, yeah. I'm, I'm really, really embarrassed to, to, to now, now not to remember the book's name. But anyway, so um, the, 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 the very, very short version of this story. People should really kind of read the book and, and, and read the paper. Uh, FBI wanted to replace their key case management system a while ago, um, and um, they, they, I guess, realized that people who know how to do COBOL are, are exiting the industry one way or another, and that's kind of risky to still keep it there. And uh, doing what you know, large organizations usually do, they wrote down all the, all the features of the old system, all the features that the new system is supposed to do. They created the request for proposals. Lockheed Martin won. Why? How? I don't know. I thought these people make rockets, not software. And um, about $90 million later, the uh, kind of FBI didn't have the system, but they didn't have, you know, the, 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 the money. They didn't have the $90 time. million dollars either. The $90 million to learn. And, and kind of then they started arguing because it had something like 11,000 bucks. So they kind of figured it's never going to go live. Yeah. Um, and then it turns out that Lockheed Martin has better lawyers than, than like FBI, that <laughs> literally every single person went to law school. Uh, and um, so they, they kind of shut that down. They, they decide to do it again. But how do we do it smarter this time? You know, how do we not, not, not yeah. make the same mistake again? And they realize what they want to do is they want to have an option of canceling that project every month. Yeah. So every, whoever wins the, the request for proposals, every month they would have to report on what they've delivered. And the FBI is going to have a chance to say, look, you know, fair enough, we, we, we've paid you so far, but let's not take this, you know, anymore. Yeah. And um, somebody else won, won the contract. And, and $360 million later, they've realized it's never going to go live. It's, it's been going on for too long. It's, it's broken too much. They can't turn off the old system. They can't turn on the new system and then the big question was how on earth did we end up spending four times more money if we had the chance to cancel it <laughs> and that's one of these you know feedback things if, if you have yeah. wrong feedback you can mislead yourself thinking that you're doing well when you're actually not and, that, sounds and, like the, that sounds like the bbc story with <clears> money. Yeah, i mean yeah. they, they said it's, it's not you know, and it sounds like the story we had uh, in, in the company I was a CTO of is just we had a lot less money to spend. So it, it yeah. hurt us a lot more, a lot sooner. So kind of, and, and their conclusion was they had this um, 
steering committee that met every month where the, the people delivering would report on what they delivered. They would measure it, you know, red, green, amber. And, and it was always kind of, you know, green or amber on, on the border. And yeah. Jerome's conclusion was that basically all that they've measured was that they're delivering what they agreed to deliver this month in terms of features. Yes. They, they, they were not measuring whether these features are useful, whether these features are, are, are needed at all, whether, yeah. you know, these, these features are complete in a sense, or, or can anybody do anything with that? And most importantly, can anybody do anything differently than what they did before? Yeah. Um, they just measured that, you know, what, what was promised was actually delivered, which is totally inside their zone of control. Yes. And... That, that's kind of the, the, the problem with uh, wrong feedback. That, that's, you know, if I'm, yes. it's, it's almost like, you know, that Monty Python and, and the Holy Grail movie where they measure if, if that poor woman is a witch or on the scales and the scales are nailed to a pole so they can't <laughs> yeah. move at all. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's completely the wrong way of measuring things and, and you can measure anything you want with that. So I, I, I remember seeing some some data about a hyper performing team that were doing eight times the velocity. Yeah, 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 that, that, that is before. amazing. Yes, yes. Yeah, and yes. It, it was it was MySpace. Yes, MySpace. So there was <laughs> were, there was, a big, the there was one of the one of the kind of big Scrum Scrum studies on on yeah, you yeah. know how Scrum made people better, and it was from MySpace in two thousand seven. You know, just yeah. as Facebook was appearing on the scene. And they yeah. were made hyper productive, you know. <laughs> F wonderful, yes. Um, yeah. So it, it also it always reminds me as well of the, the, the Microsoft study that where they 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 reckon that two thirds of their ideas produce zero or negative value for hmm. Microsoft. So you know if you know yeah, Microsoft are a reasonably smart company. If that's how good they are at coming up with ideas, then most of us are probably worse than that. So we should and, and be optimizing kind of, you know, for having lots back, of ideas and weeding out the crap ones. That, that goes back to, I've mentioned kind of, you know, Tim Hartford's book and, and Palczynski principles. And uh, so Palczynski, Piotr Palczynski mm. is, is uh, uh, the, 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 like totally wonderful uh, kind of um, story to research. He was a Russian civil engineer uh, who was erased from history by Stalin. And uh, he was... Um, uh, uh, a civil engineer uh, a, during the late imperial period and, and during kind of the shift uh, between the February and October revolutions. And, and um, so uh, he was a, a minor aristocracy kind of in, in the imperial Russia. So enough aristocracy to send him to, you know, be a boss somewhere, but not enough to be a general or, or somebody like that. And they were sending him to fix um, mining operations. And I, I, I kind of, um, the stuff we know about him, we only know because some American student in, in the 70s, uh, by mistake, checked out some, paper, some papers about him from the Lomonosov Library in, in Moscow. And seeing kind of stamps that it's all top secret and stuff like that, went and copied that and, and gave it to the U.S. Embassy. Um, and um, the, the, so he was basically uh, coming up with systems thinking and, and lean startup 150 years ago. Yeah. Um, by doing these small, small, you know, small improvements, looking at these things and, and they, you know, they sent him to fix a mining operation. And he realized that people are not kind of unproductive because... The, the, the machines are bad or it's an engineering problem is because everybody's sick all the time because they're sleeping on wet floors and, and, and they don't have healthcare and things like that. So kind of he effectively used the budget to build up clean living spaces and, and um, kind of set up healthcare for workers. And that improved productivity in the mines so much that it was amazing until the government figured out that he's doing basically a welfare program and they shut it down. Yeah. And he ended up, you know, this whole, uh, the, 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 the reason why uh, I, I really think people should study his, his life and his story. And the, there's a book about him called The Ghost of the Executed Engineer. Because he was kind of, um, between the revolutions, he, he was constantly sent to prison and then pulled out of prison to sort things out because he was the only one who can sort <laughs> things out. And... Um, I, I, and as a kind of as a typical engineer, uh, he was really bad at politics. And I think lots yeah. of people in our industry are bad at that. And, and 
you know, he um, at some point he escaped kind of um, Soviet Russia only to come back in ties to build the world's biggest uh, water, water dam. Because I think the Americans built the Hoover Dam and, and, and Stalin mm. wanted a bigger one. And then he ended up complaining about the project and explaining how it's pointless from a perspective of producing you know, electrical energy because it's going to cost too much. It's risky. It's much better to build lots of small hydroelectric plants and, and things like that. And um, he actually got kind of executed by the KGB. And I think his wife got executed by the KGB as well. And, and, and you know, that's uh, being an engineering voice of reason in an organization that doesn't want to listen because Stalin wanted a big fucking dam. He didn't want electrical yeah. energy. Um, is, is often uh, dangerous. And, and lots of people who listen to, you know, your... your Video streams are probably in an engineering profession, fighting with politics and not even understanding that they're kind of fighting, they're fighting a game that is totally on a different level. But um, I th yeah, so he, his life is and, and his story is, is wonderful to read. Check out the book of the, the, the Ghost of the Executive Engineer because he kind of predicted a lot of the stuff that happened later. Um, and um, kind of fr fr from that perspective, I think, you know, having like good engineering practice and good systems thinking can help a lot by opening up some really non-intuitive solutions. Like, yeah. you know, should we fix this thing instead of this thing because it has a cause and effect there? And, and um, th th that's why I think systems thinking and, and, and engineering practices are something that is like critically, critically important to, to handle this kind of massive complexity that we're dealing with today. And um, unfortunately, yeah, people approach it too naively. So we measure stuff that shouldn't really matter. We, you know, delay feedback where we shouldn't really delay feedback. We kind of um, delude ourselves as an industry very often thinking yeah. that we're doing well and we're not. Um, but on the other hand, there's just too much money floating around now and, and pe people are kind of constantly building stuff that nobody needs. I think may, yeah. maybe there's just a welfare program for, you know, for, for, for developers keeping them employed. <laughs> yeah, for, 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 an, for a generation before me, that was the Y2K project. <laughs> but yes, uh, so the, um, the, the story of the, uh, the engineer um, reminds me of the kinds of stories that you tell in the humans versus computers book, which which I had on my on my my bedside table for a long time. I just dip in periodically for one of those stories because it's full of those kind of funny st stories. Is where do you pick up these stories? <laughs> is, it, is it is it something that you hunt down, or, you, or is it just kind of you just you just you know you read so much that just stuff I, I, filters I read a through? Lot. I, so you know what? Why one of my favorite authors um, is is the great late. Uh, Jerry Weinberg and um, you know uh, he he wrote um, prolifically and, and and wrote about wonderful stuff. Uh, mm. But one of his less known books is uh, kind of Weinberg on writing, uh, where he talks about his process of writing because he's you know wrote so much that he came up with his own process of writing, and and he has this kind of fieldstone uh, metaphor there where he's talking about how. Uh, you know, people often build um, uh, hedges and, and, and fences with stones and, and uh, kind of just collect the stones mm -hmm. that fit something and, and they keep them there until they need them. Yeah. And he talked about kind of collecting ideas and uh, keeping them kind of somewhere and, and <laughs> until he needs them. And the Humans versus Computers book actually came from my Fieldstone kind of uh, right. folder. I have a email folder where when I read something interesting or, or find out something interesting on the internet, I send it to myself in email and just kind of label it there for later consumption. And um, I use that stuff. I, I often dig into that preparing conference talks and presentations and uh, kind of do, doing stuff around books. And um, I kind of at some point it collected enough funny stories. I thought maybe there's a book here. I see. It, I, I, it, it, it's it's a great book. What, one of my favourite stories from that book that I recall was some poor unfortunate woman. I think it was who kept having all of these weird things happen to to her because she just happened to be in the geographic centre of the USA and compute 
programmers had just kind of put that in as some kind of default starting yeah, yeah, point there was, into the software. There, there was, <laughs> there was a family. There was a family living living uh, somewhere. You know, exactly as you said. You know, yeah. th their house was the close to the geometrical kind of uh, <laughs> center of the USA, and they had this. Um, I think it was Max Mind that had this um, GOIP uh, software that they sold to uh, governments around the world, um, where you could trace stuff to to an address, mm -hmm. and if it just had a IP of a region and it didn't know exactly where in the region, it would kind of place it in the middle of that region. So there was, yeah. uh, uh, and there was a similar case of somebody kind of um, who was uh, uh, living close to the Amazon data center in, in North Virginia, where the you know the, the the SWAT team once came to knock his door over and because um, they, they, some. They thought uh, some, uh, you know, uh, financial scam bots were running from from his address, <laughs> but actually they were running on, on the, you know, in on the, the data, data center, center on the cloud. <laughs> Max Mind didn't know exactly where, so they put it in the center of that town. But if they knew there was an IP address, in, the IP address was in the U.S., but not where in the U.S. They approximated it to a geographical center. So these people ended up having, I think, 600,000 IP addresses <laughs> up into their, um, yeah. their, their, their farm, you know, that even wasn't <laughs> online at all. And the government agencies were continuously harassing them, um, looking for stolen laptops or, or kind of the stuff that was pinging back home. Yeah, that, 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 that kind of... Um makes me think of another of those kind of conversations that you and I have had occasionally about um, that other kind of feedback, the, the, you know, the, looking for that the, the kind of the, the empirical learning, because we're not going to predict all of those kinds of things. We're, we're not going to be smart enough to all of, always think of those things ahead of time. So figuring out and monitoring those sorts of things. And I, I guess that brings us to the, you know, to think about, and, you know, so, so I, I think I'm quoting back another phrase that you said to me, uh, which is so. So, is, is observability anything other than just good monitoring? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's, uh, I think that, that you know that, that's a topic for for a book on its own. I guess there's lots of uh, observability is very, very uh, kind of fashionable now, and everybody's talking about observability and monitoring things in production and. Yeah. People have been monitoring stuff for as long as I know. I mean, yeah. you know, when you so, work so, them, sometimes some of sometimes some of those interim things that didn't matter again. Yeah, yeah. You know, when <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you were building stuff at yeah. Telmax, I'm sure you had a ton of stuff kind of being monitored all the time. You know, yes, and, we did. And uh, we we kind of every single software system I've built and 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 operated had a ton of stuff that was telling us how we're doing okay. You know, whether that's mm -hmm. CPU monitors and and uh, whether that's disk monitors or, or database performance and things like that. But I think yeah. what's interesting, what, what's emerging now uh, that might be kind of the, the, the thing that differentiates observability from, from the rest of the monitoring is really um, putting probes inside the software rather than just measuring it from the outside and looking mm -hmm. for unexpected stuff. Because mm -hmm. um, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, the industry kind of figured out how to do external monitoring. You know, how do we, I think it was probably from the network people, at, at least that's my impression because the network people really had to do this all the time. So they had yeah. all these protocols to, you know, monitor network traffic and, and devices and things like that. And remember these tools emerging in the software space to kind of collect from more than one machine. That was amazing. You know? <laughs> So you don't have to log on to 10 different machines to, to, to kind of collect metrics and then show yeah. them as dashboards. But lots of this stuff was around, I think, externally visible things like CPU and, and, and uh, yeah. you know, the disk space and, 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 th and, and slowly, I think now we're getting to a place where there's all this, you know, open telemetry initiative and, and collectors everywhere and, mm -hmm. and uh, lots of ways for people to put in these probes into their, own, their their software and monitor what's going on. This is amazing from a perspective, I think, looking at unexpected stuff and, and particularly mm -hmm. looking at these kind of behavior changes, you know, um, 
there's wonderful capabilities now with deployments on, on the cloud where you can spin up you know, a copy of your environment almost for pennies um, and, and have two copies running at the same time. So in yeah. theory, you know, you have a feature that's new. You can set up a totally different copy of your production. You can send kind of um, traffic to both of them and then you can do these canary releases and, and, and wonderful yeah. things. But what people mostly do that for is they look at, you know, is my system throwing exceptions or, or am I mm -hmm. getting a bigger database load. But now I think what's what's emerging in this space is putting things like, okay, are people buying less yes. on the new system or not? Are, are, yes. are people, and, and, you know, is there something unexpected there? Maybe this feature that we built is wonderful, but it's causing people to buy less or, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the right shade of blue, but yeah. people are not necessarily interacting with the content more than they should. And, and I think this mix of um, knowing what to get feedback on, knowing how to look at things within your sphere of influence and then being able to measure it and, and monitor it through your software is what probably, uh, at least my understanding of this whole kind of uh, push for observability is. And again, the danger there is people measuring stuff that's easy to measure, not stuff that's important, and, and building up wonderful dashboards that are, you know, amazing and, and numbers going up or down. And it's it's like that, yeah. you know, Monty Python, the machine that goes ping. That, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have one of those in our living room. <laughs> it's one of the remote controls for something that doesn't obviously do anything useful. <laughs> but but so um, but 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 that 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 um, that brings us back to this kind of experimental empirical learning, I think, is it, because the, I, I, I think that, that Netflix do the kind of things that we are both alluding to with their canary index. So part of their release process is to define a canary index that identifies how you know that this thing is working okay. And I think, if I understand correctly, some of those things are designed in in the context of this this piece of work. And so, business you know business indicators, you know, are more people watching this this movie or whatever else, that kind of stuff. It sounds like the direction you know the direction this conversation. Yeah, is yeah. Going again, on. you have a behavior you know, change. More people are watching this yeah. movie and things like that. And I think, yeah, well, you know, one of the one of the most wonderful things that happened. Uh, kind of over the course of the last 10 years is, is the barrier to do stuff like that, the drop yes. so much, it's amazing. So 10 years ago, you could do stuff like that if you were Netflix yeah. or, or Google or Amazon. Now I can do that kind of stuff as, as a single person, small software vendor. It, yes. It's the, the, totally insane. Like the barriers dropped so much. Mind map is just two people, kind of me and Dave, and, mm -hmm. and we are doing everything from uh, uh, pre-sales to product management, to development, to testing, to you know, operations and things like that. We are competing with companies that have two orders of magnitude more people. Um, yeah. And, and, and you know, it's, it's a bit unfair when I say it's just the two of us, it's the two of us plus all the support that Amazon gives us yeah. that's included in the price. And, and I remember when I was um, working in, in 2005 for this um, gambling software company, you know, we, we had like every fucking weekend, the, the, there was a bunch of us staring at the monitoring screens, waiting for the databases to start falling over. And uh, because none of the clients wanted to pay for capacity they really needed at peak time. Yeah. This is too expensive. You'd have to, you know, have too much hardware there, not, not really doing anything. And uh, it was always kind of pushing the limit of, uh, you know, this uh, Saturday was, was really crazy. Kind of there was like Saturday from, I think, 11 to 1 p.m. You had 50% of the traffic going for the whole week. Yeah. And everybody was like, you know, holding their breath to see will the, will the system survive or not. I had no free weekends for years. And, and basically, um, the, the stuff I'm building now does comparable traffic because yes. it's, it's a much wider market. I, I don't remember ever having to, you know, stress about will it survive? Will it not survive? It's all auto scaling. It's, it's 
all managed effectively by somebody else. I can focus on, on the business side of things. And, and the body has dropped so much. You can do canaries now effectively included in the price of, of the whole kind of serverless thing, yeah. which is ridiculous. And, and you can um, do things like that technically that, you know, you would have to have not, not even thousands, but tens of thousands of employees before you can even start thinking about that 10 years ago. And, and that's, I think, one of the wonderful liberating factors of, of the whole kind of cloud thing that happened. <coughs> So, so you, you were you were a pretty much at least to my mind you you were a fairly earlier early adopter of you know cloud based tech and and those sorts of things at, at least for your own stuff um, and uh, and you, you you're an AWS serverless hero and and you know well known in the community <laughs> well known in the community for um, for promoting these ideas. I see, I see all the time sort of bigger companies struggling to make that transition to the cloud. What are they getting wrong? What, what, why, why is it hard for them and easy for you? What, what, what's? Well, I mean, if you're a large organization, everything's difficult, isn't it? Everything, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything, so that's the start. Everything's big. The second thing is, I think, uh, kind of, first of all, there's a lot of um, uh, gravity pull of you know from, from existing ways of doing stuff and you need to have something that escape that, that reaches kind of the escape velocity to really escape the gravity pull of of the existing thing having said yeah. that i mean there's lots and lots of examples of large orgs um at least if you look at the case studies that amazon has migrating to you know serverless or or, or you know these mm -hmm. kind of de de deployed containers and things like that if you want to be somewhere in the middle a and um I, I, what are they getting wrong? I don't know. It's probably kind of uh, trying to do too much at, at uh, you know, to, to, and and trying to do the wrong things. Probably um, that that's very difficult to to say. Um, I think one of the things that is really interesting to look at there is the shift from kind of the the static costs and 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 planning to dynamic costs, and I think. Uh, you know that, that that's a difficult sell for for some organizations. Explain um, what you explain what you mean a bit. Well, um, so if you own your own hardware, if you you know if you pay people to maintain it, you know exactly how much you're paying. If yeah. you deploy something on an auto scaled architecture and somebody just tells you we're going to bill you for this, you know as much as you use. Um, on one hand, that should be a really easy sell, and and if you look at like IBM selling that for the last, you know, 50 years to large jobs, that's what they're selling. If you buy an IBM mainframe, you don't buy an IBM mainframe. You, you, you pay yeah. them for the amount of processors they've activated. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> I remember talking to somebody from an investment bank where, you know, they had this IBM monster in the basement and uh, they, they needed more capacity. So he was kind of, on the phone with the IBM sales rep saying, oh, you know, we need more processors. When can you get them to us? And the guy said, well, it's active for you now. We've kind of had them in your building for a long time. We've just not been charging you for this. Um, so, 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 so kind of utility, you know, utilization-based pricing. On one hand, companies are already happy paying for that, like for, for electricity, for, yeah. You know, even for computing, on the other hand, there's still a lot of reluctance to kind of jump in and, and do this stuff. And I think um, that, that, that's just a, kind of the, the gravity pull of the ex existing way of, of doing stuff. There's, there's, there seem to be other barriers to me other than the, rather than the commercial ones alone. So, so certainly those, those, yeah, those absolutely, are probably. But, yeah. but, 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 the, but the, the thing that seems to make people ner nervous to me, and I can't, I can't quite work out why they weren't worrying about these things before, but it seems to me that the big step to cloud is worrying about essentially concurrent programming, shared data, distributed systems, those sorts of things, which are harder to think about, but they're the kind of things that, they're the kinds of systems that I've been involved in building for a very long time now. And so that seems normal for me. And mm. I, 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 I think that's the same of, uh, of you. So 
I, but do you, I, think, yeah. do you think that's one of the barriers? I, I think so. If, a, you, if you look at your cloud, you know, lots of people call different things cloud, of course, you know, so if yeah, you, yeah. you could you could get, uh, you know, a single virtual machine and put your nice monolith there and, and run your database and your, your kind of... Yeah. Uh, you know, web app and, and everything on it. And you, kind of given that it's just virtual architecture, you could probably kind of get something that's monstrously big to, to you know, survive yeah. whatever. Um, but the, the I think w w what you're talking about is definitely true for this whole kind of serverless thing that lots of people, you know, still can't figure out if it's a fad or not. And, and the name is not really helping. But um, for me, uh, and, and, you know, we, we, we talked about this lots of times. We've kind of shared the same uh, interests. I, I kind of, I've been building trading systems for a long time. I was building trading systems for a long time yeah. before I started building my own products. And kind of everything there is, you know, eventually consistent, distributed. You, you kind of, yes, you might have yeah. like a monstrous database at the end to settle things. And, and that's your, your kind of golden truth. But um, if, you, if you're going to hit that all the time, your, your performance is just going to be unsustainable and, and, yeah. and it's not going to scale. So um, if you look at serverless stuff, AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, you, you, your, your hello world is a distributed multi-versioned transaction processing system with, with all yeah. the concurrency and, and consistency problems that you know, these things have. You can ignore it at your peril. And, you know, you can kind of abstract it away in, 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 in certain things. Amazon does a lot to help people abstract that away. But if you approach it as a um, eventually consistent distributed system, you can, you, can, you can benefit amazingly from that. And I remember talking about this exact thing yeah. at um, Go to Amsterdam uh, five or six years ago. I... I Again, really embarrassed. I forgot the person's name. Somebody from the Erlang community, and um, kind of the, the, their argument was that most of the stuff that we talk about now with kind of these things, and and you know, I, I remember talking about messaging systems in 2008, 2009 at QCon. That was a big thing then. I don't know if you remember any yeah. like <laughs> okay. classes and that shit. Um, yeah. So again, it, it's, it's the same thing that you know cycles every ten years or so. In, yeah. in a different different kind of uh, skin. But he was talking about how when you have a system like that, figuring out the protocol that your yes. components are going to talk to, to talk with, uh, use to talk to each other is the most important thing. If you get the protocol right, yeah. uh, you can make all sorts of mistakes yeah. and, and, and fix them later. But if you get the protocol wrong, then nothing will save you. And you know, yeah. get, getting the protocol right, for example, for mind map, we've been able to throw out and guts and you know of stuff and make horrible mistakes in doing things and then replace them with something completely different. But because the protocol was right, these things were small, self-contained, easy to run in parallel, easy to test, easy to replace. Yeah. If the protocol is wrong, if everything is talking to everything else all the time using RPC and, and, and things like that, and, and uh, th then it's just a massive kind of, I, I think the buzzword for this is, is a distributed monolith where kind of everything has to go live at the same time. You can't really multi-version it. It's, a, yeah. you know, consistency is a big, big problem. Yeah. And... Um, moving away from something that runs on one or two machines to moving, to, you know, something that potentially runs on hundreds of machines in parallel mm -hmm. is, is a big mind shift. And, and it's yes. something that people don't really get to experience anymore. I think, um, you know, I, 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 again, I, I, from what I know about, you know, what you guys did at Telmax, uh, people building systems back then had to know a lot more about how the network works <laughs> than, than people do now. It, it's all abstracted quite a lot. And um, on, on, you know, I used to be a Linux admin and, mm. and kind of, you know, we, we built systems that were keenly aware of TCP and, and, and how, you know, you, you use that stuff even with a smaller number of machines. But now there's abstractions over abstractions over abstractions. And, and from one perspective, it's kind of, you know, people are no longer learning about that kind of stuff. Um, on the other hand, you know, the, the industry is a lot more productive. You know, I, I have a friend um, whose daughter had this wonderful product idea 
and um, has some programming knowledge um, and was able to build and launch a product using Firebase, the kind of the Google's, man Google's managed, you know, the database mm -hmm. serverless stuff and an app designer and, 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 and a bit of coding um, and then ended up with basically starting to hit the limits of that and, and customization and, and that and, and um, uh, kind of I, I ended up chatting to her as a way of kind of trying to help, help her fix, fix that stuff and I realized she doesn't understand at all how mobile devices talk to backends. Yeah. But she doesn't need to. She launched the product. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and, 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 and the, the product found its use, it found its customers, it, it, and, and, and somebody yeah. was able to do that without having to read, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Unix system administrator's book and learn about <laughs> TCP and, and, and things. And so on one hand, it's wonderful. On the other hand, you know, pe people are no longer learning about engineering practices when, when they design these systems. Um, and and I'm, I'm not really sure what to think about it. There's kind of there's good stuff, there's bad stuff. And, yes, um, I, 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 as 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 an old school person that did need to worry about how the computers work and the operating systems work, I, I, I'm definitely on the fence as well. But 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 one of the th one of the things that you said that that was was going through my head when you were talking um, about. Um, the, the protocols and figuring out you know essentially the shapes that you're going to build where the information is how the information is moved from one place to another and transformed and all of those kinds of things it seems to me that you know we, we spend we spend too much time talking about what's the syntax for this serverless call or that serverless call or, rather than those shapes and it's wonderful if we can raise the abstraction with things like cloud technologies where people start to worry less about that stuff and think more about the systems that they're going to build and the shapes that the shapes that they're going to create and I, I think to my mind serverless is part of that step because you really don't need to care very much about the the, the tech that's going on yeah know, i mean and that's that's true that's true a lot you know you don't need to worry too much about the tech that's going on uh at, at the same time i've seen people you know, take an app that was designed to run on, on a server, uh, kind of just package it up as a Docker container and, and then ship it to, you know, a, a, mm. a, a cloud provider and then complain that it's working slower and, and not really kind of giving them the benefits that they expected. Yes. And, you know, well, fair enough, you know, you've not designed it for, for, for that type of socket. You have a, you know, a, a European socket and a British plug. Yes, and and, uh, and, and, and I, you know, I, I, I see lots of teams that have, if I'm honest, what to, to me looks like a relatively small, simple system. And, you know, all of their conversations about Kubernetes and Helm charts and all that kind of stuff. And you're thinking, well, you know, why don't you just write it as an app? You know, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> this is really, really simple. So I think I, the promise, I, promise I, I, had, that... I had a, so, sorry, just as a silly aside, I had a conversation with one, one client a little while ago who said that they were working on a big data problem. And when we crunched the numbers on how much data they were processing, they could lo load it all into RAM, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and, and then that's, you know, so I think that there's a, uh, one side of that story is that, you know, we're getting better and better abstractions and, and we're getting yeah. better abstractions. We're getting more support. So, 10 years ago, it would have been totally impossible for me as, as a, like a single person to run yeah. this video editing tool. Yes. That's kind of now in the cloud and, and you know, people are using it. And uh, I had a case where it was recommended by uh, some uh, um, a, a relatively popular Russian uh, educational YouTuber, kind of part of, you know, there's, there's this whole thing markdown to video version controlled videos and things like that, but there's also for people that can't do markdown or version control, I've built a, a thing that allows you to create a video from a PowerPoint very easily. You, you mm -hmm. type up what you wanted to say into the speaker notes, you upload the PowerPoint, two minutes later you have a video. Um, after integrating the Russian voices, this kind of Russian educational YouTube channel uh, or kind of author figured it out, he liked it and recommended it for you know his, his audience. And Overnight, I had 15,000 people from Russia coming and bombarding the system with requests to kind of build lots of crazy Russian videos. 
um, kind of woke up in the morning, looked at the metrics and said, oh, this is interesting. You know, something happened last night. <laughs> but I, I did like this, this stuff scaled up on its own. It scaled down on its own when it was yeah. no longer needed. I, no problem at all. I, it, it was just another regular day for me. I didn't have to sweat anything about that. And, and from that perspective, it's totally amazing being able to, you know, abstract that kind of stuff away. Yeah. Um, or as, as a gray hair, you know, that, that had to do malloc and free and, and, and things like that. Uh, and, and I remember when, you know, we started doing Java, the objections that, you know, I had and other people <laughs> around me had how, you know, but how, how will it free up the memory when it needs to free up the memory, you know, and, and, and yeah. not really believing that. Um, I, I, I see a lot of that uh, now with people thinking about uh, delegating scaling to a cloud provider. And, and yeah. if I'm being honest, like, um, yes, I can do capacity planning. I've done it before. You know, I've mm -hmm. done it successfully before. I've done it less successfully before. But I'd trust people working for Amazon to do that better than I can. Yeah. Um, similarly, you know, yes, I've done malloc and, and, and free, but kind of would somebody who's spending, you know, most of their life doing just-in-time optimizations of, of memory allocation do that better than me? Probably yes. I mean, <laughs> and, and this is something that is, you know, happening over and over. I remember when I was a kid, I used to compete in demo scene uh, kind of competitions, assembly language, graphics programming. And um, we, we did crazy stuff with assembly language to fit it into like 128 bytes or, or yeah. 256 bytes and, and to squeeze performance out of, you know, a, a, a 286 or a 386 machine. That was amazing. And I remember when Whatcom, was it 8.5 or 9.5? I'm not really sure. Whatcom C, let's yeah. say 9.5 came out and, and the fucking compiler couldn't beat me in, in optimizing the code. And I realized, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm spending my life on, on this and a tool can do it better than I can. Um, I was I was writing uh, I was writing device drivers and stuff like that for a, a PC manufacturer at the time and um, um, and the four eight six processor came out and that was the thing that did it for me. I started looking at the four eight six processor and I thought and it had all this stuff where it would it would it would it would it got multiple pipelines and it would dump the pipelines depending on the instruction order and and do all this optimization. I thought. I'm never going to be able to think of all of that stuff. I'm moving up the stack. <laughs> and, and, you know, to, to kind of to bring this back to something more useful, so it's not just, you know, to, 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 two old blogs kind of you know, reminiscing <laughs> about the, the, the good old past. Um, I think uh, every couple of years, uh, th there's a shift like that. And, and, yeah. and we, you know, we, on one hand, we lose some of the stuff that kind of we can control. But on the other hand, um, people can do much more than before and, and yeah. they can, they can uh, uh, do much better stuff than before. Um, you know, 10 years ago, uh, a, a single person with kind of some knowledge of programming, launching a reasonably good product without even understanding how network works was impossible. But now yeah. we're getting better products as a result of that. We're getting people entering the industry, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, there's a good product out there that somebody's using as a result of that. Um, yeah. And that, that's amazing. That's totally amazing. On the other hand, um, I think we are not fully abstract from all of that yet. And, and yeah, maybe the, the, in 10 years some... time, you will you know, <coughs> be able to ignore it completely. Um, but I think it's worth really knowing these things and, and thinking about these things and especially applying the principles of, of, of good design to that. I think what, yeah. you know, what, one of these uh, magical things that uh, uh, it comes up every every few years. I, I remember um, when when object relational mappers came along, and I was working with a team where the, the the client hired me to figure out why their Oracle database is really struggling, um, and uh, the, the the database size wasn't anywhere close to what kind of needed to, to you know, get, get it to struggle. And um, 
I, I reviewed a bit of code. They were, they were loading up uh, some transactions and displaying in a, in a data grid for uh, the, the kind of accountants and um, kind of tracing the database calls. I just kind of trace the database calls to load up this thing. There was something like 50,000 requests going to load up <laughs> one table of data. Yeah. Because, you know, they, they, they model this amazingly wonderful domain driven uh yeah you know entities uh value objects and things like that and then uh, they've mapped it to a, a, a sql database and um the, the magic happened in between and um kind of from one perspective it's totally ridiculous but from another perspective uh, you had a team of people who had no idea how to do good oracle development building yeah. up a product that was kind of useful is just not performing yeah so mm -hmm. then they brought somebody who, who brought in somebody who knew what to measure how to measure it yeah. we replaced that loading thing with you know databases are really really good at tabular data they, 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 they kind of you know so <laughs> it's their thing <laughs> it's, it's kind of their thing yes <laughs> yeah. so, so we replaced the data loading layer with a efficient query execution and things started flying yeah. So, you know, from, 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 from that perspective, I think these abstractions give us something good, they take something away, and, and it's useful to know what, what to work on and how. And this brings me back to kind of that idea that it's really, really important to figure out the right protocol <coughs> for, for the components to talk to. And yeah. if you are kind of thinking about creating a eventually consistent distributed uh, thing, you're probably looking at messages and events. You're probably not looking at, at kind of yeah. synchronous calls. That, that's at least my experience. I, I don't know whether your experience is like that. 100%. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, when, when kind of people start, the messages are, are, are a bit tricky to get your head around the first time, but then you figure out what are the aggregates there? What do I need to send with this message so it's not chatty? What do I need to do so that's, that you know that's that's one of the things that i i am um, hope i'm keeping my fingers crossed for that the, the big cloud providers will for their next step is to I, I i've heard them talking around the edges sort of stateful serverless and that seems I, I don't what i've heard is that they're not doing a great job of that so far but that there's uh, but but if you could get some kind of actor pattern if you could get some sort of asynchronous system you know based on actors that were the the host for those sort of cloud-based systems i think that gives you another one of those steps that you were talking yeah, yeah. about and, and again it's a higher abstraction and you, and you know at yeah. the end you're going to reinvent erlang yeah yeah <laughs> and uh but uh, so, so i think uh yes i mean and and, and building up these things and and you know figuring out where where to keep the state in a distributed system and what does state even mean for a distributed yeah. system yeah. is one of the you know key architectural decisions we had to do designing trading systems yeah. and and I'm, I'm kind of sure you've kind of banged your head against that problem many yeah. many times over and i think um to, to really benefit from this whole serverless thing and, and, and auto scaling and, and being able to, you know, not worry about if 15,000 Russian teachers come to hammer your system overnight. Uh, it, 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 doing it, figuring out where the state goes and, and yeah. what is state and, and what, you know, what does consistency mean for this thing and, and how do we deal with inconsistencies? Because, um, yeah. In a distributed system, the inconsistency is going to be a fact of life. I remember once, yeah. kind of a this is a totally bizarre meeting at, at a bank where um, some business analyst was really uh, a kind of uh, getting fed up with testers asking difficult questions. Testers was always, always testers were always coming up with edge cases, and and you know mm -hmm. this business analyst was like, oh stop, stop, it's kind of pointless. You're just coming up with stupid stuff. I can't, you know, like the, this, the, the probability of that is, is like ridiculous. It's never gonna happen. It's like one in a million that that's gonna yeah. happen. Why are we wasting time on this? And kind of the head architect was in the room and said like, oh, so we do about 10 million transactions a week. So one a million yeah. means more than one a day. Yeah. <laughs> So if you want me to call you more than one a day to ask you how do I settle this transaction? Yeah. Then okay, let's not talk about it, but you know. 
So answer the stupid question. <laughs> or if you don't <laughs> yeah. know, say you, I don't know. That, that, that's okay yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. So we have these things where, you know, consistency and, and, and probabilities and things like that. Weird stuff is going to happen. And, and it's a question yeah. of, you know, what do we do when weird stuff happens is, is a really interesting design decision. And I think the fact that something is deployed on some magical auto-scaling architecture doesn't absolve you of the responsibility to kind of design your system so that it can deal with consistency or inconsistency and, and, and things like that. Yeah, and, and those are difficult things to think about. Uh, we, we've gone significantly over our time, so we, but, but as ever, it's been a delight chatting with you about these things. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this. This was fun. No, it's good. Uh, maybe we'll do something again similar in, in, in future because I, I, I've enjoyed it a lot. But I, I, let me say, let me just wrap up and say thank you very much, Goiko, for, um, for bashing our brains in with, you, <laughs> with your thinking. Uh, thank you very much for people watching. Um, do check out Goiko's books. We'll put some links in the description below. Thanks very much. Uh, and I hope, you've in, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much.